Father, we are so grateful for another opportunity to look at your word. Father, you are faithful. And Father, may we be faithful to your word today. May we be quick to put into practice those things that we hear, we know to be true. And Father, may uh, you be seen in and through us in the days to come. Thank you, God, for your word and your precious name. Amen. Good morning. This, uh, this past spring, during the NHL playoffs, there were some interesting comments made equating hockey in Canada to a religion. During the series between Montreal and Boston, CBC ran a news clip on the National, including some interviews with diehard fans, but also some local church leaders who were willing to draw obvious parallels between the sport of hockey and local places of worship and religion. Now, I'm a hockey fan, but it was a little disturbing to hear people openly confess that hockey was their god. They found themselves going to the arena to worship along with 20,000 other like-minded believers. This was on the news. Now, as disturbed as I was, I realized that that situation, that sense of euphoria that they found in supporting their local team, was obviously meeting some kind of a need or provided some sense of belonging that they weren't finding or couldn't find elsewhere. And that made me stop and think for more than just a moment. This isn't a new idea, but the illustration is a good one. It's, it's been said that there is a God-shaped hole in each person's life. And only God can fill this hole. Sometimes we try to jam something else into the hole to fill it up and give a sense of completeness to an otherwise sense of emptiness, but it's a hole that only God can fill. We've all done jigsaw puzzles where you have to match the the pieces of a puzzle up so that they fit together. You look what's on the puzzle piece. You look at the shape of the puzzle piece. And even if a particular piece looks like it should be in a certain spot, you can't just ram it into place because if it's not the right right shape, it'll destroy the picture. The hole in our heart is like that, except that it's in the shape of God. Perhaps you've watched other people around you and you've seen them try to fill the void in their life with other things. Maybe you're here this morning and you can think of things that you've tried to fill that hole with. Some people try to fill the hole with money and things that money can buy. And those people can spend all the money in the world, but we know that money can't buy peace and contentment. There is still a deep sense of emptiness. Some people try and fill that hole with family, and they spend all their time with family members. They pour everything they do into their family. Their daily and weekly routines revolve around their children and paying for all the things that they're involved in and transporting to all the activities that they're a part of. They want to make sure they have all the latest clothes and toys, and there's nothing wrong with spending time with family. There's nothing wrong with spending money on your children. There's absolutely nothing wrong with placing a high priority on family, but it still cannot fill that hole, that void in one's life that we're talking about this morning. Some people try and fill that void with friends. They place a high importance on pleasing people and and being popular in the community, but popularity and friends can't fill that God-shaped hole. Some people try and fill that hole with education, and they think to themselves, if I just study a little bit harder, if I just get that one more degree, and there's nothing wrong with getting an education, I believe in getting a good education, but good education can never fill that God-shaped hole. Some people try and fill that emptiness in their life with work and with their job. And I've lived in Brandon long enough now to know that there are a lot of workaholics in this city that are spurred on by the thought of just making another dollar. They need to to work that overtime or that extra shift. and, And oftentimes everything else gets left aside. Nothing else is important to them. Everything else can be neglected as long as their job is being done. They're trying to fill something in their life with some sense of accomplishment, but no matter how hard they try, no matter how hard they work or how long they work, they can't fill that hole that's in their heart. Some try to fill it with a carefree life, a party life mentality. Some have tried to drown the feeling with alcohol. Some have tried to satisfy the longing by getting high. But there's always an end to these momentary good feelings brought on by substance abuse and that type of lifestyle. And afterwards, the feeling of emptiness continues to beckon. The only thing that fits into the God-shaped hole in our heart and life is God. 
Everything else that we try to fill it with is just like trying to jam a square peg into a round hole. It just doesn't work. And many people have tried to do that. And you look around in our community, you see many people with no sense of purpose or plan in life. They go from day to day aimlessly trying to leave their mark on something. People want answers to many of life's basic questions. Questions like, why am I here? Why really do we exist? Comments like, there has to be more to life than this. There has to be more to life than just the routine, regular daily grind of work and making money and living, but for such a brief moment of becoming aged and dying. There has to be more to it than this. There has to be something that will satisfy this longing in my life for more. People are looking for answers. And here's the thing. We believe we have the answer. And the answer is found in Jesus Christ, who came to fill a void that's in our hearts and lives and completely satisfy the longing of our souls. He's the one who gives people a sense of completeness and a sense of purpose. And it's interesting that you turn on the television, you see all the shows that are dealing with the paranormal, the afterlife, even the spiritual. The world seems to have a keen interest in, in finding some answers to questions these days. There's an interest in the supernatural. And I remember the, the buzz around town when Mel Gibson's Passion of the Christ came to theaters here in Brandon. It's hard to believe that that was 10 years ago, 2004. Wow. And I remember some people appreciated the movie and some did not. And some people liked or disliked the movie. And, but what I remember the most is that you heard people talking about it everywhere. You couldn't escape it. It was on the television. It was in the newspapers. It was all everyone was talking about for a few weeks. I remember tuning in and watching those two famous movie critics on television, Roger Ebert and uh, Richard Roper, and they were commenting on this movie. And, and what intrigued me was a comment by Ebert, and it wasn't so much a comment on the movie itself, but rather what was happening around the movie. And I found that quote again, and he said, Everywhere I've gone in the last week, I found myself in conversations about this film, serious conversations about theology, about religion, about spirituality. You know, people usually talk about sports or the weather. This is good that we are talking about a serious thing. This past year, we've seen a whole slew of religious films in the theaters, movies like God's Not Dead, Heaven is for Real, and Noah, just to name a few. Even Hollywood is picking up on the fact that there's a keen interest among people for spiritual things. You ask the average person on the street, and they will all give you a different answer. But the average person will tell you that they believe in God or a God, or something, a power, or a presence, or a force, or something that is out there beyond the human and natural realm. And many will say they believe in something, but they can't explain it to you. They can't necessarily put their finger on it, but they know there has to be something else out there holding this universe together. Perhaps in a time of crisis, they breathe a prayer. Perhaps on a special occasion, they will give thanks before a meal. Perhaps they will light a candle or repeat a verse. They don't know exactly what they're doing, but they feel that they're supposed to do something, so they do it. There's this, there is something that is inside them that needs to reach out to something that is bigger than they are. But this thing that they're worshiping or praying to or longing for is unknown to them. They have no relationship with it. They don't even understand what they're looking for or why they feel this longing in their heart. And we have the answer. And it's our duty, our mandate, to share with people that this feeling they have inside them, the answer to their, their question, the des their desire to worship and pray, is a longing that's placed in our hearts by God himself, the God, the only God. In Acts chapter 17, we, we find a portion of Scripture that is actually a sermon. Paul gets an opportunity to preach to a group of people who have no relationship with God. It's Acts uh, 17, verse 22, if you're following along. It says, Paul then stood up in the meeting of the, Europ the Europagus and said, Men of Athens, I see that in every way you are very religious. For as I walked around and looked carefully at your objects of worship, I even found an altar with this inscription, To an unknown God. Now what you worship is something unknown I'm going to proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in temples built by human hands. He's not served by human hands as if he needed anything. 
Rather, he himself gives everyone life and breath and everything else. From one man he made all the nations that he should inhabit the whole earth. And he marked out their appointed times in history and the boundaries of their lands. God did this so that they would seek him, perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he is not far from any one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. And some of, some of your own poets have said, we are his offspring. Therefore, since we are God's offspring, we should not think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image made by human design and skill. In the past, God overlooked such ignorance, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent, for he has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed. He has given proof of this to everyone by raising him from the dead. Paul stood up in a meeting in Athens and he looks around, and he was looking for an edge, something to springboard from. He was looking for a crack in the door so he could get an opportunity to share the message of Jesus Christ with these people who knew nothing about a God who loved and cared for them. So he sees all of their altars, their pagan altars, and all their inscriptions, and realizes what a heathen place he has found himself in. But he spots an altar with a rather peculiar inscription on it. It read, to an unknown God. And Paul thinks, that's it. That's my edge. That's my, my way into this discussion. And he uses their own false altar as a springboard into a discussion about God, the true God. So he starts out, men of Athens, I see you're very religious. You have all of these altars. I, I've read their inscriptions. I see you even have one labeled to an unknown God. You've been spending time worshiping a God that is unknown to you. Now I want to tell you about the real and living God and how you can get to know him. And from there, Paul went on in his discourse and presents Jesus Christ as the only way to salvation. This passage mentions this longing, this void, this, this reaching out for something beyond. Although people do not realize it, this longing has been placed at every heart. Uh, placed in the heart of every person by God himself. Verse 27 says, God did this so people would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he's not far from each one of us. This hole in people's lives, this void, this emptiness, this need for something beyond themselves is something placed there by God himself and can only be filled by God himself. But we need to be the ones to go out and share with others that this feeling they're having this thing that is unknown to them can become known to them. This God they know nothing about actually wants to have a relationship with them. He longs to have a relationship with each one of us today. We need to make this unknown God known. The people of Athens were actually more superstitious than religious. They were careful to build altars to every God they could think of, lest they hurt one or get one of the gods angry. Some say they were so worried that they may have missed naming one of the gods, so they built altars and labeled them to the unknown god just in case they missed one. They wanted to have all their bases covered. Historians tell us that there were many altars to unknown gods in Athens. 600 years earlier, a terrible plague had fallen on the city. And it seemed as though nothing could stop it, so in their superstition, they, they came up with a plan. They gathered together a flock of sheep, and, st and starting from the area known as Mars Hill, they let these sheep loose throughout the entire city, and, and wherever the sheep lay down to rest, it was to be sacrificed to the nearest god. And if a sheep lay down near a shrine of no known god, it was to be sacrificed to the unknown god. And now in our passage, 600 years later, Paul finds himself again on Mars Hill, and it's from this situation that Paul took his starting point in his discussion. When people are in crisis, they will call out to God. Not necessarily the God, but any God. They, they want anyone to listen. They want an answer for their situation, and they don't really care where it comes from at that moment. And it's our job to step into those situations and point people in the direction of the one and only true God, the only God who hears and answers prayer, the God who desires to have a relationship with us and, and has an ultimate plan and design for our lives. And it's our job to point people towards God. It's our job to tell people how they can fill this longing that's in their heart. It's our job to tell people how they can have a sense of purpose in their life. People want to know God. 
But the world has a very confused attitude about who God is and, and how he works. And some have no idea that he is a God of love who has our very best interests in mind. Many people do not realize that. Who do we say that Jesus is? Who do we tell? What, what do we tell people? Do we point to him as the only way? Do we tell people that he is the answer for their lives? Who do we say Jesus is? This God that is unknown to people, do we desire to make him known to others? In the Gospel of Mark, we find an account of Jesus talking with his disciples and asking this very question. Mark 8 and verse 27 says this, Jesus and his disciples went on to the villages around Caesarea Philippi, and on the way he asked them, who do people say that I am? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked. Who do you say I am? And Peter answered, you are the Messiah, or you are the Christ. Just before this passage, Jesus healed a blind man. And Jesus continued on his travels around the villages, ministering to people. People had seen Jesus heal the sick. People had seen Jesus give sight to the blind. People had heard Jesus' words as he preached and taught a message of peace and hope. So Jesus inquires of the 12 men that follow, of the 12 men that followed him everywhere. He turns to his own closest friends, and he asks, who do people say that I am? And for the disciples in that moment, it was an easy question for them to answer because they were just reporting someone else's opinion. So they say, some of them are are saying that you're John, John the Baptist. Others are saying that you're Elijah. And still others think you're another prophet come back to life from our past. That's what everyone else is saying about you. And I look around in today's society, and, and Jesus asks us the question, who do people say that I am? Who do people around you think that I am? Jesus asks us, who do the people of Brandon say that I am? It's a good question to ask. Who is Jesus in our elementary schools, in our high schools, where our children and young people attend? Who is Jesus on our university and college campus? Who is Jesus at the workplace? Who is Jesus at the local sporting events? Who is Jesus in our homes, in our neighborhoods? Who is Jesus to the people of this city, this community where we live? And I'm sure if we were to stop and ask people of our city who Jesus is, we'd be surprised by the answers we would be given. Some may know a little bit about him. Some may think he was a good teacher or maybe a good leader. Some may know a little bit about Christmas or Easter. Some may uh, consider him somebody from, from our history. Some would claim that some of his teachings were politically incorrect and not for today. Some some wouldn't believe the things that had been written and told about him at all. We'd get all sorts of different answers about who Jesus is. And you wouldn't have to walk too far in any area of this city on any given day to find a person whom, if they were asked who Jesus was, may even respond, I don't know who he is. I don't know who you're talking about. That's right here in our city. So Jesus is about to ask his final question. In fact, the first eight and a half chapters of the Gospel of Mark have all been leading up to this one important question that he's about to ask. But before we get to that question, I want to look back at the very first verse in the Gospel of Mark. Verse 1 of chapter 1, the very first phrase of Mark's Gospel starts off by stating who Jesus is. Mark writes this, The beginning of the Gospel about Jesus Christ, the Son of God. After this statement, for the next eight chapters, Mark is silent on who Jesus is, except for a remarkable sequence of events that demand a decision be made about Jesus' identity. Jesus displayed an extraordinary power, which astonished his countrymen. Scattered throughout the first half of the Gospel of Mark, we read about Jesus eating and associating with sinners, which was scandalous to the Pharisees, the keepers of the law in that day. And they sought to kill Jesus for it. And Jesus' recognition of demons frenzied his opposition. Even his own disciples, his closest followers, tried to realize who Jesus was many times, but could not fully understand. It was as if a veil had been put over their eyes, blinding them from who Jesus really was. And the weaving together of these events, along with the miracles and signs that Jesus did, and the lives that Jesus touched, created a tension that needed to be resolved. Who is this man? 
And finally, I sense with a hint of frustration, Jesus asked in verse 21 of chapter 8, do you still not understand? Do you still not understand? So in verse 29, Jesus turns to his beloved disciples, the ones who have seen his whole ministry, the ones who should be able to put the pieces together and figure it out if anybody could. He turns to them and asks that pivotal question, but what about you? Who do you say that I am? Who do you say that I am? And Peter, being the spokesperson for the group, speaks out and says, well, you are the Christ. The Gospel of Matthew records Peter's answer as, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And immediately the focus of the book changes. Now upon a realization of who Jesus was, Mark sets out the dramatic events leading up to the death and resurrection of this man who was the very Son of God. And that sacrifice that was to be made for the entire world. What place in history did Jesus have? How does his life affect us today? What message about Jesus Christ do we have to share with the city of Brandon? How does the Jesus who walked on earth 2,000 years ago have any meaning for people's questions and people's lives today? How do we make this unknown Jesus known to others? Several years ago, my wife Heidi bought me a, a history book as a gift. She thought I'd find it interesting reading, and, and I did find it interesting. It's not on my shelf anymore. I think my son must have taken it. The book was called The Makers of History. It had everybody in it that you could think of, and I've read, I did read most of all the way through it, from Solomon in 1015 B.C. to modern-day Gandhi. And each person had two pages about their story and their contribution to world history, and I think I've mentioned this book before. It had a lot of beautiful pictures and illustrations. It was a very impressive book. And I remember leafing through it, and I was wondering what this type of book would say about Jesus Christ. It's a history book. So I looked him up, and I found that he wasn't in there. They did not find him important enough to write anything about. And I thought about this for a while, and I found it almost humorous, because as I flipped through it some more, I noticed something. Each person had a date by their name. In fact, the book was set up in chronological order, 356 B.C., 640 B.C., 1281, 1789. And I noted the abbreviation B.C., and in some books they also use the abbreviation A.D. as well. B.C. is an abbreviation for before Christ. And A.D. is an abbreviation for the Latin words Anno Domini, which means in the year of our Lord, again referring to Jesus Christ. So here you have this history book entitled The Makers of History and telling about all the famous people in history. The whole book's dating system admitting to revolve around one man, Jesus Christ, who must have somehow done something great to have everything in history dated around his life here on earth, yet he was somehow not considered important enough to write about in that particular history book. Some people have tried to erase the influence that Jesus had on the world. Some people have even tried to obliterate that he even existed. So what place in history did Jesus have? How does he affect us today? Jesus is the son of the living God. And God loved the world so much, the world he lovingly created, and he saw how sinful we had become, and then we were all headed for destruction and an eternity apart from him. So he loved the world so much that he sent his son Jesus down to die for us and to live, among, uh, to live among us a perfect life, an example of love. He healed the sick, he raised the dead, gave sight to the blind, helped the poor, compassion on people everywhere. And everywhere he went, he preached a message of hope to a lost world, only to be led away to a cross by the same people who had so vividly seen his love and care displayed right in front of their eyes, led away to a cross to die. A perfect man the very Son of God, came down to earth because he loved us and died in our place. We have a message to share, a message of hope, a message of life. Romans 3.23, the same Apostle Paul that we find in Acts 17 in Athens preaching to the men there, and we find writing these words to the church in Rome, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. All of us have sinned. There's not one of us who are perfect. And again, Paul writes in Romans 6.23, For the wages of sin is death. 
The price for our sin is death. We deserve to die for the things that we have done wrong, but God, not wanting us to have to pay that price, sent his son as a sacrifice for us to pay our debt and to die in our, pla- die in our place. We should have been the ones that died on that cross or hung on that cross. But God so loved the world that he gave his one and his only son that whoever believes in him shouldn't perish but have eternal life. Yes, Romans 6.23 says that the wages of sin is death, but it doesn't stop there. The verse actually goes on. It says, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So now we have a way to accept eternal life if we believe on Jesus Christ as our Savior. Now we have a way to have a relationship with Almighty God. That's who Jesus is. That's who Jesus is. As we go about our business and our activities this week, we have a responsibility to represent Jesus Christ and who he really was and is. Our city, in many respects, doesn't have a clear picture of him. Some wouldn't even be able to tell you who he is. The fact that you know who Jesus Christ is, the fact that you know Jesus Christ's love can change lives, should make us want to tell others of his love for them. How he's more than a person who faded by in history, who didn't make it into one of my particular history textbooks. He is the Christ, the Son of the living God. And in Acts 17 and verse 24, Paul gets up and preaches that the God of creation who made everything, the same creator God, wants to have a relationship with us. He desires that we would come to him and choose to serve him and live for him. At the end of the chapter records that there were those that day that turned away from Paul's message. They rejected the message, and it says they even sneered at him. As we go out and share with people that God wants to have a relationship with them, we'll come across many that will not believe the message, and they may even think less less of us for believing it ourselves. But it's also recorded at the end of chapter 17 that some people did respond to Paul's message and accepted Christ as their Savior, and this God that was one time unknown to them became known. We have a job to do. Jesus commanded us to go out and preach the good news everywhere. That first verse in the Gospel of Mark declared that, this is, that the Gospel was about Jesus Christ. And if you turn to the last chapter of Mark, you find this verse. It says, go into all the world and preach the good news to all creation. We need to make Jesus known to people who at this point do not know him. And the most powerful witnessing tool that we have at our disposal is our own testimony of how God has transformed our lives and how living for God makes all the difference in our life. And my prayer for us as a church is that we live, as we live out our lives in this community, we would be people who represent Christ well by the decisions that we make, by the words that we say, by the actions that we choose, by being people of integrity, and by being people who are willing to to live with eyes open to needs around us and see ways that we can minister God's love to those needs. If others cannot see Jesus in us, then we're doing something wrong because Jesus didn't just have a select few that he called to be his witnesses. He called every one of us to be his witnesses. So may our lives have an impact on our city this week. May we be bold to share with others that only Jesus can fill that God-shaped hole in their life. And if you're here this morning, you realize you do not have a relationship with Jesus Christ, we would like to make him known to you. Maybe you have discovered this hole or this emptiness in your life. The only thing that will fill that hole is Jesus. Only Jesus will give you true peace and contentment and a new life. We'd love to be able to make Jesus known to you this morning and share with you how you could begin a life with him. Let's pray together. Worship team, you can come as I I pray.